For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Good morning, Radiant Church. How's everybody feeling today? Good? That, that bad, huh? All right, good. <laughs> Can we just go ahead and say hello to all those who are over at our Portage campus? Come on, let's put our hands together and welcome them. We love you guys. If you're new to Radiant, maybe you don't know, we are uh, one family that has two rooms. We have uh, a campus at Portage. Actually, we have multiple rooms because we have about eight other Radiant churches that are meeting all over the city and are all over the, the state and the region, and uh, some great leaders. Some of them join us on Sundays, and so uh, we just want to say hello to you. We love you guys. Pastor Stefan and Candice, you guys are amazing. If you brought your Bibles with you this morning... Uh, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, and while you're turning there, uh, I'm really concerned about something, and so uh, I want to bring it up because there's two kinds of people in the world, and one of them concerns me. There's the kind of people that set their Christmas trees up before Thanksgiving, <laughs> and then there's the kind that set it up afterwards. How many of you, since you're in church, I'm very concerned? Uh, set your Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving. Raise your hand. Can we just all reach out and pray for them right now? Because <laughs> there's a real need for ministry to take place right now. The Lord wants to change hearts. How many of you have not gotten your Christmas tree yet? Raise your hand. How many are going to wait like me until Christmas Eve and put it up? Okay, just four of us. Okay, good. Anyways, I just need to get that out of the way. Um, this is part four of our series entitled 316, the series that is based off of the most, I think probably the greatest Bible verse in all the Bible, John 316. Now, you could debate that. You might ask, why do you think it's the greatest Bible verse? I don't think it's the best Bible verse, although it's pretty good, but I think it's great because it encapsulates in one verse what the entire Bible tries to say in 66 books. If you just had one verse to communicate the gospel, John 3.16 is it. And there's so much that lies below the surface. That's what we're spending multiple weeks this holiday season working our way through, even on a day like today, which is the big give uh, weekend, to really look deeper below the surface than just kind of saying it, but what's the real depth of it? What's the meaning of it? And so week number one, we took the first couple words, for God, and we looked at who God is. Week number two, so loved. What does it mean for God to love us? Week three, the world. So what's the world? What's the world that we live in? What's unique about the world? How does God see the world? Today we're gonna continue in that same vein. He gave. He so loved the world that he gave. And I want us to all to start this morning by together, out loud, saying John 3, 16. Uh, it's gonna be up here on the screen, so let's say it out loud, everybody all together, ready, set, go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the gospel in a nutshell. This is it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus. And if anybody believes in him, they don't perish, but they have eternal life. This is the essence of the gospel. This is why we're here. This is what has changed our lives. And this morning, we're gonna be zeroing in on that phrase that he gave. What does it mean that God so loved the world that he gave? I know that we know that what he gave was Jesus, but I don't know if we completely understand the implications of that gift and what he expects us to do with it beyond just believe in it and receive that. There's more to it than just believing it. It's supposed to change us and affect us and the way that we live our lives. And that's why I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter 22 because before there was a John 3, 16, there was a promise given in Genesis 22. In fact, I believe with all my heart that it was in the mind of God, even before he created the world, that he was going to give his son 
that Jesus would willingly lay down his life as the son to save fallen humanity and to bring us back to God. You might say, well, why do you believe that? Well, the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus, the lamb of God, we'll talk about lambs and sacrifice and what that means. He was the lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. It means literally it was the intention of God. It was the plan of God that Jesus would do that. But even though it was in God's heart, he didn't reveal it to us right away. The Old Testament is really a progressive revelation of who God is. It starts off with God is creator. It leads us to Jesus as savior. And it's a story of God's people unveiling or seeing God unveiled before them of who he really is. One of the most powerful aspects of God's revealing of himself is found in Genesis 22. It's to a man named Abraham. Abraham is the man that in Genesis chapter 12, God said, I am the Lord God Almighty, walk before me. Leave everything you know, go on a journey. I'm gonna give you a land and I'm gonna bless you. In Genesis chapter 15, God then reveals to that Abraham, he says, I'm gonna bless you, Abraham, and I'm gonna make your descendants, your children, your children's children's children, as numerous as the stars in the heaven and the sand on the seashore. Abraham, it says, believed God when God gave him all those promises. Even though he was old, even though Sarah, his wife, didn't have any children, he believed God. And it was reckoned or accounted to him as righteousness. That's why Abraham is called the father of our faith. In Genesis 22, Abraham and his wife Sarah, after multiple, multiple years and decades of barrenness, have a child, his name is Isaac. Isaac was the fulfillment of the promise. In their 90s, in their 90s when Isaac's born. How many know that's miraculous? I mean, that's like, hey, I know you're buying diapers, but not usually for you know, your own kids at, in your 90s. It's, it's, sorry, it's Thanksgiving weekend. Um, Abraham is, should be planning retirement. The dream of having children and grandchildren and all that kind of stuff, long gone. But God had given them a promise. And then even after holding on to that, they have this child of promise named Isaac, which means laughter, joy. And and every time Abraham looks at Isaac, he sees the faithfulness of God, the promise of God, yet unfulfilled. Isaac is the encapsulation of, of all of Abraham's hopes and dreams and future, everything. In Genesis 22, beginning in verse number one, God speaks to Abraham and he says to him, it says that after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah And there, I want you to offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar, And then Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went both of them together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they both went together. And when they had come to the place that God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and he laid the wood in order. And then he bound Isaac, his son, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and he said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't lay your hands. Don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. 
And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Man, there's just so much in this. I don't know if you can fathom for a moment what it must have been like. For Abraham, whose son is finally coming to the age of getting married, having children, starting his own life, that you've been dreaming about since the moment that he was born, when he was a young rascal (laughs) running around, a miracle in your house. And every time, every day that you've gotten up, you've looked at your son and you've said, this is, he's my only son, he's everything. All of my hopes, all my dreams, my future, my promise, my purpose is wrapped up in him. And most rabbis, most biblical scholars believe that by the time of Genesis 22, Isaac has grown to probably his late 20s, early 30s. He's not a small boy anymore, he's a full grown man. And one day dad says, come on, we're gonna go worship the Lord. So servants come along with him. They go on a three-day journey from Beersheba, which if you don't know where Beersheba is, it's at the lowest spot in the kingdom of Israel. It's in the wilderness. And they go north to what's now modern-day Jerusalem, to the land called Moriah. And when they're just a, a short ways off, they can see it. Abraham says, stay here. Isaac, come with me. And some interesting things, it says, number one, it says that Isaac was his only son. Number two, it says that when they came into Jerusalem, they were riding on donkeys. And then it says as they got really close to the place where they were going to offer his son as a sacrifice, it says he made his son carry the wood. Abraham brings Isaac right up to the top of Mount Moriah lays the wood out, Isaac is catching on to something's going on. I know we got the knife, I know we got the firewood, I know we've got the fire, where's the lamb? And then Abraham, his father, grabs him, holds him, binds him, lays him on the wood. It's a pretty gory picture to think of a father doing this to his son. It wasn't really out of the norm, though, in the Iron Age Middle East, in which Canaanites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Amorites, Moabites, mosquito bites. <laughs> it wasn't out of the ordinary for Mesopotamian, Middle, Middle Eastern, Iron Age cultures to worship gods that required human sacrifice. You and I look at that and go, that's just bizarre. It wasn't, wasn't out of the ordinary for these people that worship Baal and Asherah and Tophet and Moloch. And Abraham was very familiar with all those gods. They were his neighbors. He was familiar with those gods because when he lived in Ur of the Chaldees, tradition is that that was the profession that he learned from his father, Terah. He was an idol maker. He made gods that people worshiped like that. So when Yahweh, God, the almighty God who had revealed himself, called him to do this, I don't know, but I think that there was an inner struggle that was going on on the inside of him. Number one is God's testing me. It says it really clearly in verse number one, God tested Abraham. Are you gonna be loyal? Are you gonna be faithful? Are you gonna be obedient? But on the other hand, he's like, I thought you were different than the other gods who aren't even real gods, they're idols, they're fake, they're at best demonic powers that are masquerading as deities, and at worst, they're just the imaginations of men who are trying to figure out how to deal with their sin issues. But I I know you, I've heard your voice, and I've heard you promise me that you were going to bless me, and through my descendants, you're gonna bless the other nations of the world. How is that possible if My son dies. Honestly, I think two things are going on here. I think number one, Isaac 
represents his promises, but Abraham knows that even if he obeys God and slays his son, he has so much faith and confidence in the God of the promise that he believes that God will be able to raise him back from the dead. He wasn't lying to his son. He knew. He was confident in God, God who's able, God who will keep his promise no matter what. And you know what? He was right because God is able to raise back from the dead a son that has been slain out of obedience to the father. See, because Genesis 22 was more than just an internal battle with, within Abraham. It was an internal battle that was going on in the, in the heavenlies. Because God was showing Abraham, he was doing two things. He was testing his obedience, but he was also showing Abraham who he was. You see, because what he did was he let Abraham walk through the same journey that he as a heavenly father walked through, sending his son, letting him come into a city on a donkey. Isaac had to carry the wood. Jesus had to carry the wood. Isaac could have fought back against the father. He's 30 years old. His dad's in his probably hundreds. He could have fought back and resisted, but he doesn't. Jesus didn't resist. He went to the cross like a lamb silently to the slaughter. He could have resisted, but he didn't. He was bound to the wood. But at the last minute, the angel of the Lord intervenes and says, Abraham, don't do it. I wanted to show you what I'm going to one day do on a different mountain. I wanted to show you what it feels like, how much it costs to give in order to save but I'm not gonna ask you to do what other deities would do. Other deities would have you to kill your son. No, I'm the kind of God who actually steps in and says, I'm not gonna ask you to do it. I'm actually gonna do it for you. I'm gonna offer myself. I'm going to become the substitute. And what we know is that a couple thousand years later, Jesus Christ, the lamb, the spotless lamb of God, would walk a hill in Jerusalem, go to the top and not resist the Father's will, but would carry his own wood and would become the spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice for our sins to rescue us and to bring us back to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not only did God send his son, Jesus willingly laid down his life. Nobody took his life, Jesus said in John. Nobody takes my life, but I willingly lay it down. Jesus and the Father willingly did it to save us. But there's some things in this story that I just think are, are masterful and powerful on God's part. Number one is the, the mountain called Moriah, literally in Hebrew language, means the place that God sees. See, because what was going on was the testing of Abraham's heart in the area of giving. What will, you, what will you give me? How much will you give me? Will you give me it all? Will you give me your plans? Will you give me your dreams? Will you give me your future? Will you give me your family? Will you give me everything? How much of what belongs to you are you willing to submit and surrender to me? And the other thing that he was testing was can you trust me Abraham, when the things I ask you to do don't seem to make sense and seem illogical and irrational in the moment, trusting that my nature of being a good God in the end has a plan. I'll tell you what, if you've never been tested like that, you haven't been alive for very long. All of us as followers of Jesus will follow, find that kind of test. God, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense what you're asking me to do. It doesn't make sense why I'm at this place in my life, my hopes, my dreams, my future. I'm trying to do it your way, but it seems illogical. If I surrender every part of me, I have fear. Fear that if I let go, <laughs> that if I let go, everything's gonna die. But what we find in the story of Genesis 22 is when you actually let go, that's when things really live. That's when the promises of God come alive. Why? Because God sees. And as soon as we let go, that's where 
God becomes the God who is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, for it will be provided on the mountain of the Lord. See, what God was showing Abraham is God, God was saying to Abraham, I'm testing you, but I'm also letting you test me because what I'm going to show you in this circumstance is that I'm not just the God who gives, I'm a God who is a giver. I'm part of who God is, is generous. Has anybody found God to be generous with you? I'm just talking, I'm not talking about things. I'm just talking about in life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all those fruits of the spirit are the goodness of God, his generosity towards us. He's blessed our lives. Jesus is the greatest gift that could ever possibly be given. If you just need to know what generosity is, just look at the cross. God is generous, but in Genesis 22, on the mountain where the Lord will provide, God was saying, this is who I am. I am your provider. You can trust me. I am your provider. You don't have to be afraid. I am your provider. I know your past. I know your present, and I know your future. I know what you have. I know what you don't have. I know what you want. I know what you don't want. I know what I wired you for. I know what I created you for, and I am a God who is involved in every facet of your life. You're never going to have too much. You're never going to have too little. All I need to know is that I got all of you. And if I've got all of you, you will never lack a single thing in your life. See, God reveals some things on that mountain. Giving reveals a lot of things about who God is. Giving reveals a lot about who we are. And I'm not talking about giving like the world gives. I'm talking about giving like God gives. If we look at this story, we see God's generosity. I wonder... I wonder how we can gauge our own hearts. What's the thermometer that we can use to take the temperature of our soul of whether we're really following God, whether we're really servants of the Lord, whether everything in our life is really submitted to him, or whether you know we're, we're kind of going through the motions, holding our breath, at, thinking maybe God's not gonna... A little question for you. How many of you, when you were going to school, every once in a while you decided you didn't wanna go to school that day so you would learn to fake being sick. Anybody? Anybody? Raise your hand, you liars. I know. <laughs> I did it. I, I mean, didn't want to go to school. It's like, uh, uh, God, I got a sore throat, Mom. Really what I wanted to do was watch cable all day long and avoid taking tests, especially in my senior year. I had a bad case of senioritis. And I was like, oh, man, my throat's red. My mom got wise to it because I used to be able to just I don't feel good, I'm gonna lay in bed. And it was fine. She'd make me pot pies, you know, like I'd, I'd eat pot pies and bread and butter and watch cable. It was the best days of my life. It was like, I'm not taking tests. My mom started getting wise to it. So when I said I was sick, I didn't feel good, she walked in my room with a thermometer. Let's take your temperature. Digital thermometers. It's like, why did they have to come out with those? So put it under your tongue, take your temperature. If you did not have a fever, you did not stay home. You could be missing a limb, but if you didn't have a fever, you were going to school. My mom's like, oh, no, you're fine. You're going to school. Thermometer. It's like you do everything. Put a pillow over your, you know, double blankets up to get hot or whatever you could, but it didn't work. She always knew. Thermometer gives it away. And can I tell you that God has given a thermometer for you and I to tell the temperature of our heart, whether we're well or whether we're sick, whether we're really submitted to the God who is the God who's provider, whether we're acting like God, or whether we've become infected with the love of money, with self, with materialism, whether our heart is in the kingdom after the things that God is after or whether we're after building our own kingdom and the things that our heart's after. And that thermometer that tells our heart is our giving. It's our giving. Because giving reveals three things. It reveals three things about God. It reveals three things about each and every one of us. Number one, giving reveals our priorities. Giving reveals our priorities. What's important to us? It's been said, if you want to know what's important to somebody, what's a priority, just look at your checkbook ledger. But I know we don't write checks anymore. So everybody thought you're off the hook. It's like, I just use my debit card. Yeah, well, we also have smartphone apps that show us all of our debits and all of our deposits. It's a ledger. And if you were to go through your ledger today, 
Some of you are like, I haven't ever balanced my checkbook. Shame on you. Dave, Dave Ramsey, you, you need to take that class. I mean, I don't even know what the balance of my checking account is. Man, come on. But if you look at that thing today, what would your ledger say about you? What's the priorities of your life? Because you can say something's a priority, but where, you put your money where your mouth is. You put your money where things are valuable. If you were to look at my ledger, let me tell you what would be important. Number one, food. Anybody with me on that? I like to eat. I, I'm, and, and I like to eat like good stuff. Try and eat pretty healthy, but when Tuesday comes around, it is Taco Tuesday at Mi Pueblo. If you've never been to Mi Pueblo, just smack yourself because you've done yourself a disservice. Dollar tacos on Tuesday. I mean, and they're chicken tenga. And, oh man, they're carne asada. And go there and I like to eat. You will see it every week. Taco Tuesday, Taco Tuesday, Taco Tuesday. Two weeks ago, I went for lunch and dinner on Taco Tuesday. <laughs> I went at lunch, came home, Jane's like, I'm hungry, let's go to Mi Pueblo. <laughs> so, number one, you'd see food. Number two, you would see books, because I like to read. Uh, I, if I'm talking to somebody and they'll recommend a book, I'm on my Amazon app, looking it up, there it is, swipe. How many know that one touch, one click, one swipe thing is a killer, right? Amazon, 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 mi pueblo. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Third thing that would show up on my ledger is Jane. She's not here this morning. She was in the first service, but I love getting stuff for Jane. If Jane sees something that she likes, she's uh, Dutch and kind of cheap that way. She's like, oh, I'll just keep my eye on it. It's like, don't keep your eye on it. It's going to be gone. One day you're going to keep your eye on it, and then it's going to be gone. If you like it, get it. I mean, within reason. So if she, she knows, and we have a rhythm. She knows she doesn't have to feel guilty about buying it. She just has to show it to me. I'll buy it, and then she doesn't have to feel guilty about it. So she's like, do you like these boots? Oh, I love those. Those are awesome. She's like, yeah, I'll keep my eye on them. I'm looking it up on Amazon. Swipe, Jane. There it goes. Because Jane's a priority to me, and I, I, giving is part of, uh, gifts are part of my love language, and so I love, to, I love to do that. And it used to be my kids, but now they're like 20 and 23 and 25, and it's like, you're on your own now. I paid for a lot, and now, you know, you're on your own. Those are priorities. Kingdom of God, number one priority. First check Jane and I write every single month, every single paycheck, is not just, we, obviously we give our tithe to the local church, but we have missionaries that we support individually that we give to. We love to give into the kingdom of God. It's a priority of our life. If you were to look at the priorities of your life, what would show up on the ledger of your heart? What shows up? You look at the ledger of God, you know what's number one? The world. You. Your name shows up on God's ledger because he paid the ultimate price for your salvation. If you look at God's ledger, it would be 7.7 .7 billion names that God's investing, that he's giving to. It's because giving reveals our priorities. Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Think about that. Our, where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. It's our priorities. What's, what's important to us? What should be important to us? You know, we're tempted sometimes to get so wrapped up into the things of this world, but the things that we think are important are only important for a period of time. They're temporal. How many realize that even like in clothes and fashion and things, things have a lifespan about them? Possessions have a lifespan about them. Jesus said thieves break in and steal. Rust corrodes it. Moth destroys it. And he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where these things don't happen because wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. A lot of the reason why our heart is so anchored into this world is because that's where we're investing our treasure. The way to get your heart deeper, further, and more committed in the kingdom of God is put your treasure there. It's invest, because what happens when you give is, listen, your giving, your generosity changes your priorities. 
When you give into kingdom things, you're not giving into things that have an expiration date on to them. You're not buying a pair of buckle jeans that in 2006 were the hottest thing and now you can't give them away to anybody that you know. You're giving into something that will last for eternity because it's giving into people. People last forever. That's why when you look at God's ledger, it's people that are on the top of the things. This world is passing away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. This world is gonna be renovated, it's gonna be renewed, but the only reason why God created this world was for, to have a dwelling place and a meeting place between heaven and us. God loves the globe, he loves the planet, and we're supposed to be good stewards of the planet, but he loves it because he loves us. What happens is we fall in love with the world to the exclusion of the people. First John chapter two says, don't love the world, for all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all these things are fading away. But that's different than John three sixteen saying that God so loved the world. Well, which is it? Are we supposed to love the world or not love the world? God says, I want you to love the people in the world and I want you to steward the world, but I don't want you to fall in love and get your heart anchored into the things of the world because wherever your treasure is, your heart will be anchored there. I think there are a lot of people that can't rise above worldly thinking because they're anchored to the things of this world. You've got change and shifts our priorities and that's what giving does. Number two is giving is an overflow of thanksgiving. It's an overflow of thanksgiving. We just, you know, we all gathered together a couple days ago to give thanks. And hopefully we took time, you know, in between watching the lions get destroyed and, and the turkey get destroyed and eating rolls with mayonnaise and spicy mustard and turkey. How many know it's time to throw the turkey away when it tingles in your mouth? It's like, mm, that's okay, we're probably done. But on Thursday, man, everything's good. It's like we're eating pie and, but hopefully we gave thanks. Do you know that Thanksgiving is a posture of our heart and attitude that opens up heavenly doors? It opens up heavenly doors. It opens up doors of God's provision. It opens up doors of God revealing himself as our provider. What a stressful way to live our lives thinking that we've got to provide for ourselves, that we've got to figure it all out. But what a profoundly supernatural life it is for us to live our lives knowing God is my provider. Everything I have in my life belongs to him. It's on loan to me. What a profound place it is to get in life where you can say different than the way that the world gives. The world gives because there's a return investment. The world rings a bell and we drop money into a red kettle. The world gives because we want the tax write-off. But the believer gives because we are so full of gratitude and thankfulness at what God has done that we can't help ourselves. Freely we've received, therefore freely we give. I mean, remember where you were before Jesus saved you. If the gospel is nothing more than a self-help improvement plan to make ourselves a little bit better, a moralistic, therapeutic deism where we just see God as the one who's gonna brush us up and make us the best possible version of ourselves and we can be, but we're pretty good before that, then we won't be thankful. But if we realize I deserved hell, I rebelled against God. I was sinful and dead in my trespasses. I was an enemy of God. I was in this world without Christ and without hope. I deserve judgment. Nobody's getting off this planet alive. And one day I was gonna stand before God as his enemy. And in the midst of that, long before I ever loved God, God sent Jesus who took my place, paid my debt on the cross. Then God raised him up and offered me new life. He said, you're a slave. Do you wanna be a son? I said, yes. He says, you've been living on the streets. Do you want to live in my house? And I said, yes. He says, I'm going to bless you, keep you, and use you to change the world. And my life has been radically changed. And you want to know what fills my heart every single day? It's massive gratitude. It's massive gratitude. It's like, God, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. You can have anything, all of me, because without you, I don't have any of it. It's the overflow of thankfulness. It's just like, thank you, God. Thank you. This last week, there was a young man, it was all over the news, a young man named John Chow, who, Christian young man who was passionate 
about reaching the nations of the world. Studied missions, and he went against all odds to a, to a people that have never been reached on a remote island off the coast of India. And he wrote in his journals letters to his families, don't get mad if I'm killed because they don't know any better. I, I, I'm willing to lay my life down for the gospel. He loved people so much. He believed in the gospel so profoundly. He was willing to do whatever it took even to risk his own life. And he went onto this island. He had some breakthrough, but he ended up getting speared through. He got shot through. He was martyred for the sake of Jesus. And he was joyful about it. He loved not even his life unto death. You know what I was blindsided by is when I got on Twitter, the hatred that was expressed towards that young man. If he had been doing something that the world considers valuable, they would have celebrated it. This guy's dead for his political convictions. This guy's doing something for the environment. This guy is trying to bring, you know, Greenpeace to the, whatever. Anything that the world views as valuable, they would have celebrated. But because he's this radical, in love with Jesus, believes the Bible to the bone, that those who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved, that they will not perish, that these people need and deserve to have a witness. They need to hear the gospel, that it's the only power unto salvation. He's willing to lay his life down for it. We ridicule him, and we hate him, and we mock him, and we wish that something worse had happened to him. That's the way that the world thinks. But do you know that that young man's predecessors who lost their lives in the jungles of Ecuador about 30 or 40 years ago made a statement about giving. He said this, he is no fool who would give up what he can't keep in order to gain what he could never lose. He is no fool. Missionary in Ecuador, him and his whole company had been martyred for the sake of the gospel. And I, I'm going to be honest. I, I sit back sometimes and I say, Lord, when I talk about giving, when I talk about generosity in the kingdom of God, most of the time I'm thinking about money. And you know what I'm realizing? Money is the easy part. God, I want to be willing to give it all. If that required my life, maybe. I mean, I'll, I'll, it, it might someday. I don't know. I want to be able to say, yes, you can have it all, Lord. But you know what I know is that every single day of my life, I have the opportunity to lay my life down. Every single day that I get up, I have an opportunity to deny myself, not fight the Father's will, and to live out of a generous overflow. Because the third thing that giving reveals about us that we need to understand is that giving is always sacrificial. It always costs us something. It always costs us something. If it doesn't cost us anything, it might be charity, but it's not kingdom generosity. David in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 24, was told by God that in order to divert a curse that was on the nation, he needed to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And he knew right where he wanted to go, Mount Moriah where Abraham had been willing to offer Isaac. Why? Because he needed God to be a provider. There's a problem. There was a man named Aruna who owned the threshing floor. It was a, a threshing floor for wheat on top of this mountain. So David went to Aruna and he said, I want to buy this from you. And Aruna said, no, 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 no. You can have it. He was being generous. You can have it. In fact, if you're going to offer sacrifices, here's the lamb. Here's the goats. You can have it all. And David's answer to him is profound. He said this, no, I will pay full price because I will not offer to God anything that costs me nothing. Giving is always sacrificial. You wanna know why it's sacrificial? It's because when you feel it, God feels it. When it moves you, it moves him. When something has died in your life that that money could have been used for or your time could have been used for, but you willingly let it die for the sake of the kingdom, it releases access to life that you never, ever could have imagined. 
I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in my own experience. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in our church. Because you see, God always calls us to the mountain of sacrifice. Mount Moriah was a mountain of sacrifice. Abraham and David both climbed up to the mountain of sacrifice. And both of them, it says, built an altar to the Lord. Jesus would climb the mountain of sacrifice. Not Mount Moriah, but Mount Calvary. And he would offer the perfect sacrifice because it's on the mountain of sacrifice that we are able to see further and from a higher perspective than we've ever seen before. And this morning, God's calling us all to the mountain of sacrifice. That's what Kingdom Builders is about, Radiant Church. It's not just a program, it's us saying, We're going all in and we're gonna live sacrificial lives. We're gonna invest in those who've never heard. We're gonna reach our generation. We're gonna reach this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're gonna say no to some things in this world so we can say yes to some things in eternity. We may not know the names and the faces, but we are concerned and in love with the people that you, God, are in love with. And we're gonna give and we're gonna feel it so that the nations will glorify your name. And that's what the big give offering is about that we're about to receive. It's about us saying to the people in our city, Jesus is the one who provides. It's not us, Jesus provides. I'm gonna ask everybody at both campuses to stand up and the ushers to move into place. This is an opportunity for every one of us to participate in the big give offering. I wanna remind you it's two things. Number one is this offering It's for Woods Lake Elementary. It is for the Lumiere project that we talked about last week in Africa, which is our global project. And it is to help plant Radiant Church, Guadalajara, Mexico. And we're gonna pass the buckets and receive that, but we're gonna do it in an environment of worship because giving and worship go hand in hand. We're not just gonna give to God here, we're gonna give to God here. Amen? Father, we love you, we thank you. Right here, right now, we build an altar of generosity, of thankfulness, and overflow. Jesus, you are the priority of our heart. Use what we give today to change somebody's life for eternity. In Jesus' name.
want everybody, if you're with your wife or your, your husband, just grab hands. We're just going to pray over what we just gave. Lord, today we pray that the gifts that we just gave, Lord, that you would put your supernatural touch upon them to be used to impact people's lives. God, we're saying we want to become more like the God we worship. Lord, we want thanksgiving and generosity to be the overflow of our lives. And we pray that as we do that, as we take steps to do that, we pray that there would be an intensification of the heart of God and the eyes of the Holy Spirit to see like you see and to love like you love. Pray that Woods Lake Elementary would never be the same again. We pray that Northern Western Africa would never be the same again. We pray that Guadalajara would become a radiant city in the midst of Mexico and Latin America. Lord, we've done our part. We pray you put your hand upon it and do your part. In Jesus' name.